So good morning. Oh, it's afternoon now. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jamie Coleman. Um, I'm having a bit of an identity crisis at the moment because I've got a Sonatype t-shirt on. I actually now work for Sonatype from last week, but with an IBM hat on and an IBM on my badge, I'm not actually sure where I work anymore. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I work for a, a Sonatype. I'm a developer advocate. I started off working on mainframes at IBM. Uh, then I moved on to Open Liberty in the WebSphere product team. And today I kind of want to talk to you a little bit about Paquito um, and what that is. Uh, hands up, has anyone heard of Paquito before? One person. Okay, good. So hopefully the rest of you will learn something today about this technology. Uh, I have a clicker. Awesome. Um, so a little bit about what I want to talk to you today. Uh, talk a little bit about what polyglot applications are, um, why you would bother using different languages when creating applications. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what a build pack is. Um, this kind of came from Cloud Foundry. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, an introduction to Paquito, what it is, how it works, how it works with Java. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a demo today, A, because of time constraints, and B, I haven't actually got a Docker license at my new company yet, so I can't actually demo what this does. But I can talk you through it and show you what it does. Um, and then, yeah, some useful links at the end and a little talk about why this is important. So we all probably know what polyglot applications are. Um, essentially, the ability for you to use different languages in your application. Applications written in multiple languages. Um, and these are done to basically capture the functionality and efficiency of different languages. Because some languages might be efficient at doing things better than others. Um, it also allows development teams to kind of pick the development stack they want and what they're used to. It allows you to hire from a bigger pool of developers rather than just being able to hire, say, from Java developers. Um, so it's quite good in a lot of ways. And also, who's heard of the 12 factors? This was created by Heroku. I see a few people, yep. So there's a few additional factors, and I'll talk a bit about those later. Um, but essentially, if you abide by the additional factors like API first, security, etc., cetera, um, it makes creating applications using polyglot um, programming a lot, lot easier. So these are the 15 factors. Um, I'm going to pick on you because you said you've heard of the 12 factors. Do you know what the additional three that have been put in here are? One of them is, I can't believe, was not in the original factors. Like, it's just crazy to me that they forgot about this. 15th one, yep, security. How, we shouldn't, how that wasn't put into the original 12 factors, I don't know. Um, so I'll give you a little hint. It, next one was API first. So that's defining your APIs up front and telemetry. Um, so these additional factors were created. The original factors were created by Heroku. Um, and then they had a rethink later on. Uh, the order has changed a little bit, but essentially they were at, these were added to kind of, uh, when the original factors were created, the clouds and everything was a new concept. I mean, microservices, yes, they've been around a little bit before, but um, it basically enabled people to do additional things. So API first, if you define your API, what it enables your other teams to do is to get on building their applications. They know what your API does. They know what they should be sending to it, what they should be getting back from it. So the, each team doesn't have to keep talking to every, all the other teams saying, how does this work? What should I be sending to this endpoint, et cetera? So defining that first makes creating polyglot applications a lot, lot simpler. Um, authentication and authorization, I'm going to throw some very, very scary facts at you later about this. Um, definitely things to think about, and telemetry is just kind of an obvious one. So to put this in concept that we can understand a little bit more, because yes, everyone preaches to us, okay, we should save, we should save our companies a bit of money on the cloud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, for us as developers, we're not saving ourselves any money, really. Um, yes, it's nice to save our companies a bit of money, but what I try to think about is energy, saving energy, uh, saving carbon, et cetera. Because once these cloud providers have set up these huge data centers, their main expense is electricity. It's energy, it's to power these things. So if we can make our applications more efficient, we can help save the planet. Because if engineers aren't going to do it, I'm not really sure who is going to be responsible for doing it. Because most of the time, it's not going to be our governments. Um, so let me just go back to that slide. So there's half a million data centers around the world the lands they consume is 6,000 football pitches, that's European football pitches, and in 2019, that was equal 
to one and a half times the UK's energy consumption. So everyone around the world is using these, if you're using Facebook, Twitter, whatever you're doing on your phone, you're using these data centers in the back end which are consuming massive amounts of data, uh, energy. Now, the hardware engineers um, have been doing a very, very good job at this. They have curved the trend. So if hardware efficiency stayed at the same level in 2010, um, we would be all the way up there. Now, luckily, the hardware engineers are doing a lot to make the hardware a lot more efficient. But I think now, as software engineers, it's our time to make sure our applications are as efficient as possible, not only just to save our companies a bit of money on cloud infrastructure, but to save the energy on the cloud as well. So it's up to us to basically create applications that are energy efficient. So microservices, this is why you know, Java might not always be the great fit for microservices. If you think about it, you've got an overhead of a JVM in every microservice, and that's a big part of your stack. Um, and JVMs were originally created to run lots and lots of applications, not just one application and one runtime. Uh, your application could be like five megabytes, but then you have this stack, a part of your, J your stack, a JVM, which could be, yeah, some of them are quite small now. You can get them down to 40, 50 megabytes, but it's still a huge part of the stack. So it doesn't, Java might not always be the perfect runtime for these things. And all the people, uh, all the different flavors, you can get all these things from Adoptium, et cetera, I know they're here. Um, a lot of the JVM producers and creators are trying to make them more efficient for the cloud. The problem is when you make a change to one of these characteristics, it can have a detrimental, detrimental effect on another one. So if I reduce startup time, for example, GraalVM does this very well, they can start up very, very quickly, that might affect throughput. So it means then we might need double the same microservices to achieve the same goal. So it's something you always have to think about, especially when you're picking your stack and what technologies you want to use. Make sure that you're not picking it just because it starts up really quickly when you don't need that. Make sure you're thinking about throughput, response time, memory footprint, ramp up time, because the time it takes your JVM to start up is completely wasted energy and wasted money. So, a little bit about OpenJ9, and I, I, even though I don't work for IBM anymore, and I just, again, I'm still a bit of an identity confusion here, um, I am talking a little bit about IBM tech in this. So OpenJ9 was IBM's JVM. Uh, this has been used in the industry by enterprises for 25 years. It spans things from mainframes, power PCs, ARM architecture. So it's a very, very robust JVM, and it has lots of different functionality that can help you in a lot of ways. Um, the throughput of this is absolutely amazing, and they have just input, uh, introduced a new functionality called Instant On, which will allow you to start up your applications in milliseconds with a full-blown JVM. So you can get some of the benefits that you do from using, you know, compiling to native and things like that, but with great throughput and, you know, an actual JIT compiler that does, you know, have a very, that's very robust and provides a lot of throughput. So very, very good JVM. Um, but again, just look at all the different flavors, all the different versions of JVMs out there because they all do different things and don't just pick things just for the sake of it. So some characteristics of OpenJ9. This is off their website. I'm comparing it to Hotspot, as you can see, 51% faster startup time, which is great. Um, a smaller footprint after startup. Uh, so like I said, ramp up time is important because the time it takes your JVM to get to where it's basically at a peak throughput, that's completely wasted time as well, wasted energy, etc. So consider all these things when you're trying to pick what stack you're going to use. And hooray for Java. Um, I saw this uh, on LinkedIn, which was a study to check well, to study to see what are the most efficient programming languages out there. Oh, sorry. Um, and Java is still in the top five. So that is an amazing, amazing feat uh, if you consider how old Java is. I suppose the lower down, I mean, Java's not very low down, but I suppose the lower down the language, um, the more efficient it is. So when I used to work on mainframes, we would program in... Uh, to a level assembler, a little bit higher PLX, things like that. And the reason mainframes are very efficient and do what they do very quickly is because the core products were built so low down that they can really take advantage of the hardware speed. But yeah, Array for Java, it's still a very, very efficient language, which is good. Um, so again, the, the, these are kind of some of the advantages of using polyglot applications, save time, money, and energy. So increase engineer creativity if they can use the, you know, whatever language they want, whatever stack they want for creating their microservice as part of a big application, they're going to be more creative of what they can do. Um, it should hopefully speed up time to market. 
Uh, you can, again, like I mentioned, you can draw from a bigger pool of talent and you can create more efficient applications. Uh, I think LinkedIn have been using Polyglot applications for their whole infrastructure for quite a long time now. Um, but there are disadvantages which you have to think about. So scaling issues, it's a lot easier to scale things when you're all creating stuff in the same language and it can add to complexity once you've deployed it because obviously things are all running um, differently. So a little bit of talk about what build packs are. So build packs kind of came from Cloud Foundry um, and essentially what they do, it allow you to transform your source code into container images. Um, Heroku, uh, the guys who created the original 12 factors, they actually created build packs originally. Um, and basically Pivotal and Heroku were creating this at the same time. They decided to merge their streams together um, because it, there was no point creating the same product twice. Um, so together they kind of created this and released this in 2018. So build packs have a lot, a lot of functionality. Um, advanced caching, uh, auto detection, so it can automatically detect not only what app, what's, uh, language you're using, but the runtime you want to use as well, just by looking at your directory structure. It can produce a bill of materials, which I'll explain why is important in a moment. Um, it's modular and pluggable, so you can use different, combine different build packs together to create something. So, for example, I could use the OpenJ9 build pack and the Open Liberty build pack to create a stack that I can use, or I could use the Open Liberty build pack and the Hotspot build pack to create something. So, you can plug them all in together as well. And like I said, it's multi-language support, so it supports most of the common languages. Um, it will produce a very, very small image. So I've been trying this, and I've got my images down to about 30, 40 uh, megabytes in size. In terms of rebasing, you can update all the base layer. So say if you're using uh, Ubuntu, you can update the base layer without having to rebuild your images. It will automatically re uh, rebase those themselves based on any new vulnerabilities that come through Conical. So that's really cool as well. Reproducibility, um, again, you don't need configuration files for this. I don't need a Docker file, I don't need configuration files. I just point this at my source code and it goes and builds what I need. Um, so it makes reproducing this um, nice and easy. So some of the things build packs help with. For, first of all, compliance. So ensuring that software licenses are being used correctly, this is something that can be a problem. Um, a lot of the main reasons for this are usually complexity of software licenses, um, inadvertent misuse, lack of software asset management, um, lack of education, and internal misuse. And the main two things this can help with is inadvertent misuse, so making sure that if you're accidentally, if you're using some, a license accidentally, this can basically say, look, you're using this license in your application, make sure you're paying for it, or etc. Um, and it can also help, yeah, recreating S-bombs and all kinds of stuff. It can actually really help you just look at what you're actually using in your stacks. So that's the compliance side. Uh, so essentially, um, it works in two ways. You essentially have a build image and a runtime image. So the build image stack provides basically the base image, which you're going to build from, and the run image is separate. Now, they do this for security reasons, um, just so you can't inject stuff into the build image that can then get into your production image. So a little bit about why we should care about security. So again, this was missed off the first 12 factors, which I'm not 100% sure why. But if I could show you some crazy facts. In 2016, cybersecurity surpassed the drug trade and how much it makes. In 2016, that's $450 billion a year they're making, or $14,000 a second. That's equivalent to 50 of these humongous Nimbus aircraft carriers that the US have. That was in 2016. Do you want to know what it is in 2022? 22, it's about six trillion a year. And you can tell I just did a conference in Croatia because I've got the amount that is in Croatian Kuna. Um, I couldn't even, I don't even know what that number is, so I just put it down. But that's $200,000 a second. And that's the equivalent to 620 of these monster aircraft carriers a year. That is what cybersecurity, that's what they're earning. So if I put that into context, if cybersecurity was a country by GDP, it would be the third largest country in the world. Just these are hackers. So, you know, you think about Pablo Escobar these days. Well, today's Pablo Escobar wouldn't be dealing with drugs. He'd be dealing with computers. He'd be hacking people and making money this way. So I want to talk about why this is important because this is what build packs can help with. So, for example, um, you can benefit from all the security provided by Conical and Ubuntu. So, like I said, you can, it will automatically add the security fixes you need without you having to rebuild your, um, your containers. 
Um, all stacks are run as dedicated non-root users to help as well. Each stack has a detailed metadata describing the image components, which I will talk about SBOMs in a moment. Um, again, separate images for building and running your applications to help with security. Um, and the build images run with different user IDs. So now moving on to the company I currently work for, uh, Sonatype. So with build packs, you, you have full control over the open source um, op uh, operating systems underneath, languages, and package management. And what this can do is it can produce uh, something called an SBOM. Now, anyone here, hands up, heard of an SBOM before? One person, two? OK. So SBOM stands for Software Bill of Materials. And this is very, very important these days. So the US government, I think about two months ago, made it law that in the next two years, every um, anyone that sells them software has to produce a software bill of materials uh, and make sure they're responsible for any vulnerabilities going in. Um, and the fact that people don't know what SBOMs are, well, if you sell to the US government, you're going to have to know what they are very, very soon. And I'm pretty sure every other government in the world is going to em end up implementing this legislation. So the EU will, everyone else. So do pay attention to this because it probably will be mandatory if you deal with any government assets. Um, so like I mentioned, software bill of materials, uh, it basically will list all the packages and libraries in your application. Um, and this is really good because it produces a consistent readable uh, profile of your application's dependencies. Um, this can also be used for license managing. The problem is we're all using so much open source this day, these days, like humongous amount of open source. I think only like 20% of the applications we write is our code. The rest is all borrowed um, from places like Maven, uh, which Sonatype brand, way. Um, so we're using huge, huge amounts of open source, and we just don't think about who's creating that open source, the vulnerabilities in there. And hackers are pretending to be open source committers and put stuff into open source projects. Question, yes. Precisely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, you're 100% right. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So um, Brian Fox, the creator of Sonatype, he was one of the main Maven committers. He created Maven Central. And after that, they realized very quickly what they had done. Um, that's why they went away and created Sonatype to kind of try and fix this problem because it is... Don't get me wrong, uh, it's an amazing thing that everyone can pull like, all the open source code. In it. Why would you write the same code that someone's already written, right? It's just a waste of time, a waste of effort. But it introduces, like you're saying, like Maven pretty much created this problem by doing, like, creating Maven Central, right? Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be able to freely download open source dependencies, because it's amazing that we can, um, but we just need to be a bit more conscious of what we're downloading and making sure we tr really trust who we're getting them from, right? Oh, cool, nice. <laughs> oh, awesome. Right, yep. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, yeah, everybody uses it. it it's, it's something that will help. It's not the cure, right? Yeah. You've got me worried now because I've only been doing this for a week, so I'm just trying my best here. So. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Oh no, no, this is a, this isn't a Java problem. This is every, Node has much more vulnerabilities than Maven Central has. This is not specific to Java. This this problem has existed before. Um, yeah, Maven Central. I'm just here talking about Maven because we're at a Java conference, right? And Maven Central is where the Java community gets its packages from. But all Ruby, all of the other languages have exactly the same problem because it was inevitable that we were going to share open source code eventually, right? So this problem, they, 
it was just inevitable that it was going to happen. So, yeah, that's kind of why I'm just trying to stress that it's important to think about security when creating applications. And it's quite scary because, you know, you download a dependency, but that dependency has a dependency on something else. And then that dependency has a dependency on something else. So going down that list is, again, quite a worrying thought that, you know, anything you could be using and you're only you typing 20% of your application's code these days, 80% of it you're borrowing, do you know all those authors? So it's, it's something that you always, you know, definitely something to think about. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, Sonotype have this cool thing called Bomb Doctor, where you can point it at your GitHub repo, and it'll go through all your dependencies, um, and it'll give you, it'll tell you the health of them, tell you if there's better ones you can use, better versions, etc. Because moving up to the latest version is not always the greatest thing. Um, but yeah, I'm talking about build pack, so yeah, I'm going to go back to my original thing. Um, but thank you, really good, good point that you made there. Thank you. Um, yeah, maintainability. So again, maintainability is something we like to think about, um, and this can help with that. So again, auto detection of source code changes is great. Um, using multiple build packs to create your application images, like I mentioned, you can use, I could use, uh, for example, Open Liberty, with all the database providers all have their stuff in there, and these are all supported by the actual companies themselves. Um, this isn't just the community doing this. Most of the companies all support these and keep them up to date when they do a new release. So it's, it's good because you get the latest and greatest. Um, again, the images contain only what is required for a lot of this stuff. Instant updates, like I mentioned, without having to rebuild the base, things like that. So it helps a lot with maintainability. And if you were to compare, say, build packs to some other technologies around that can do similar things, as you can see, there is a lot of functionality that build packs have that the other technologies don't. So, introducing Paquito, let me just see how much time I've got. Okay, we should be all right. Um, introducing Paquito. Um, so, Paquito is kind of what builds the build packs. Um, it transforms, like I said, your application source code into container image, supports the main languages, PHP, Java, Node.js, Go, NetCore, Ruby, etc. cetera. Um, and it really does make life a lot easier. I hate having to deal with YAML. I hate having to deal with Docker files and things like that. You don't have to worry about any of that with this. It works with Gradle, it works with Maven, so all the main build tools, so you can plug it straight into what you're using now. Um, and how does it kind of work? So you can install whatever JVM version you want. They're all supported, as you can see down here. Um, pretty much every JVM provider has their stuff on uh, in build packs, so you can just pick whichever JVM. And again, make sure you make the right choice. Think about what you're building, what characteristics are important to you. Is it startup time? Is it throughput? Is it this? Is it that? Um, don't just pick something because it's you know, the new thing that everyone's using. Um, basically, yeah, it's very, very simple. So if I wanted to start it up, um, I don't need to provide it much. The things down here are really basically just environment variables I can pass into, um, pass into my uh, build. Um, but really how it works is it knows what language you're doing by obviously your source code. It knows what runtime you're using by your directory structure. So for example, with Open Liberty, we have um, a, a directory called config and in that we have our server config. Just by that, Paquito knows that I want to use Open Liberty and it'll go and fetch the Open Liberty runtime and build that for me. I don't have to specify anything in a Docker file. Um, Paquito just knows straight away. So it's very, very cool. Um, I can't not mention Open Liberty, um, even though I don't work for them anymore. But yeah, I can't not mention them because it's kind of the point of some of this presentation. So Open Liberty, um, if you haven't heard of it, is a runtime by IBM. This was open source the same time as Open J9, uh, five years ago now, because I think we've just had our fifth birthday, which should be the next slide, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's open source about five years ago. And really, this runtime was to kind of fix the needs of developers. I mean, if a lot of you have used uh, WebSphere before, traditional WebSphere, um, it, don't get me wrong, we have customers, I, I know of a customer that had been running one of our application servers for 15 years and never shut it down, just because they were too scared to shut it down, to be honest. But developing with that kind of technology is difficult. It's very big, so like gigabytes in size in containers. Um, it's not really designed for like one application running on top of it. To start up, it could take 10 minutes. Um, whereas in Open Liberty, we kind of went back to the drawing board and wanted to create something that was very developer friendly. So the goals of Open Liberty were always to, so developers can focus on code, make changes as quick as possible, um, tr supporting true to production testing, stuff like test containers. If you haven't heard of that, definitely check that out. 
Uh, my first job in WebSphere was actually to containerize it, um, create a DevOps pipeline to produce those containers and push them onto um, Docker Hub. And I didn't really know what a container was back then, um, but I think we were the first IBM product to actually be in a container. So um, we've been working and working to make sure they're very, very robust and very efficient in containers. Um, this thing called Dev Mode. Um, very similar to something Quarkus has. Essentially what it allows you to do is to make changes to your application code, your test code, and your configuration without having to restart the application server. And the application server will compile these and deploy them within milliseconds. So for you as a developer, it allows you to kind of get on with coding and doing what you need to do um, and just kind of forget about the runtime behind it. So Open Liberty supports a lot of the main developer-friendly things, um, the main APIs. And if you're using Spring Boot, we also support Spring. And with Spring, yes, Tomcat starts up, I think, about maybe one second quicker, something small like that. But if you don't care about that, then Open Liberty is a really good choice because the throughput with Spring is nearly double what it is in Tomcat. So if you think about that and you're deploying lots of microservices, the hope is you'd need half the amount of microservices to do the same job. Um, so if you haven't heard of Open Liberty, you haven't checked it out, um, do check it out. It is a really, really good runtime, in my opinion. Uh, one of the best all-round runtimes for everything, because it has pretty much all the functionality that WebSphere traditional server has as well, but with characteristics like it can start up now with Open On in about 0.1 seconds. So it's got some crazy startup times with a full-blown JVM behind it. Um, so Open Liberty Build Pack, um, we, like I mentioned, we fully support this. Um, you can check out all that information in GitHub, um, where we store a lot of the information about how we support it and different things you can do. Um, and every time we do a build and we release a new build, which we do every two weeks, um, this is also updated. So if you're using Paquito, you do get the latest versions of our stuff. Um, with Open Liberty, there's different flavors you can use. You can use the full flavor, um, specific flavors uh, for microprofile, et cetera, and Jakarta EE. So it's entirely up to you what you need and what you want to get out of it. So getting started with Paquito. Um, again, I don't have time for a demo today, and it's nearly lunchtime. But the thing I'd advise for Paquito is to look things like SBOMs. They are very important. Again, we are using huge amounts of open source code these days, so we do need to be careful about what we're using. Um, do we trust it? How good is that code? And again, hackers are pretending to be open source committers. They're pretending to add new functionality into our favorite libraries, you know, doing us a nice favor, but really they're sticking vulnerabilities in that we're going to then go and download and it will go straight into our application code. So always think about the security of your application. And again, why Heroku didn't put that in the first um, 12 factors is beyond me. Um, do check out MicroProfile. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this here because you probably there's probably lots of talks about it at being at ClipsCon. Um, again, MicroProfile is just an open source community specification for building Java microservices. Uh, these are some of the original contributors to MicroProfile, so thank you to everyone there for their contributions. And MicroProfile, these are the different vendors and implementations. And what I always like about MicroProfile is it's vendor neutral, so you don't have to get stuck with a specific vendor. You know, if their support's not right, if they're charging you too much money, you can just shift it to a different vendor, so that's always a great thing. And with MicroProfile, I've found that it does, it's not very... It's a nice light library, it's a nice light specification, so you can achieve what you want very, very, very efficiently. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, because again, there is lots of talks here about MicroProfile, but this is essentially the, st the stack of MicroProfile 5.0, and at the top are some of the standalone projects which you can use with MicroProfile, so if you're into reactive programming and reactive architecture, there are um, projects there that can help with that. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Jakarta EE here because, again, you've probably heard this too many times, but these are some of the members of Jakarta EE. Um, one cool thing about Jakarta EE and Open Liberty, though, is Open Liberty has a zero migration policy, which I don't think I've seen anywhere else. And what that means is we've had a problem for years of our customers being stuck on old versions of our software. Now, we have 500 developers working in WebSphere. And we're pumping out new versions of WebSphere Liberty, Open Liberty constantly. But if our customers are all on a one-year-old version, a two-year-old version, it's annoying for us because they're not getting all the latest and greatest um, functionality and features we're putting into this technology. So with Open Liberty and Jakarta TE, we have a zero migration policy, which means, in theory, you should be able to move to the latest version of the runtime and your code should not break. 
And that is important because it means it keeps organizations and our customers on the latest and greatest stuff rather than, you know, okay, we're on a five-year-old version. Um, now we're going to upgrade. It's going to take a year of doing some testing. We're going to do some security testing, et cetera, et cetera. We wanted to try and avoid that with Open Liberty. So um, it's really great that we have this zero migration policy. Again, I'm not going to be able to show you a demo. I don't have a Docker license yet with my new company. Um, and in the essence of time, we probably don't have enough of it. But very, very simple to do. Um, there is a guide uh, on the Open Liberty website. So if you go to openliberty.io forward slash guides, there is a Paquito guide there if you want to check out this stuff yourself. We also run on a cloud hosted environment, which means you can try out all our technology um, without having to download any prereqs and things like that. So it's very, very useful. So a quick recap at the end. Um, I know I've bombarded you with quite a lot of information today. Um, Polyglot applications can be really great, providing you create them in the right way. So again, using things like API first. Um, when you're creating net new applications, remember security at the start, because if you can try and implement it afterwards, it can be very difficult. Also, think about the things build packs can offer, advanced caching, auto detection, again, bill of materials. All these things can make our lives as developers a lot, lot easier. We shouldn't have to worry too much about the runtimes underneath and the JVM, et cetera. Um, we should just be able to focus on our code, and that's what build packs do help with. Uh, and also, Open Liberty with Michael Profile and Jakarti are really, really great sources. Open Liberty is a very, very performant um, runtime. And again, even if you're using Spring, do check out Open Liberty. There is a guide, again, at that uh, address that will tell you how to try out Spring with Open Liberty, but check it out. You might notice some really, really great performance benefits. And also the same with uh, OpenJ9. Um, I've had performance benefits just using OpenJ9 with my Eclipse IDE compared to other JVMs. So do check it out, because there is a lot of different functionality in there to make our lives, well, to make our applications a bit performant. Um, some of the research this talks, if you want to know any of this information, I will put this online afterwards. I don't know why I haven't put the actual URLs there, but yeah, here's some of the information to some of the things I've talked about today. Um, there's some links and materials to MicroProfile, some of the technologies there, Open Liberty, and some other useful stuff like test containers if you haven't ever checked that out. Um, we are quite active, I say we. Open Liberty is quite active on uh, social media, so if you have any questions, do feel free to reach out to us. IBM has a booth here at the conference. Um, and we do have Open Liberty t-shirts. Uh, I do have one in my bag, but yep. We do have Open Liberty t-shirts and some swag. And um, Emily Zhang will be signing her book later on. Um, so I think about five or half five. So do swing by the booth to go check that out if you want a signed copy of her book. Um, I don't, oh, see, I've left Croatia in there. Ignore that. This is Germany. <laughs> so yeah, I just want to thank you all for attending my talk. I hope you've learned something. And if you've got any questions, either feel free to ask me in here or ask me at the IBM booth, or I'll just be walking around the conference pretty much the whole day. But again, I've got, still got a bit of an identity crisis because I'm not sure where I'm working. I've got an IBM hat on. Um, it still says IBM on my badge, but I definitely work for Sonatype. So yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thank you all for listening to my talk, um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Just so it doesn't say Croatia, I'm going to go back to there. Um, does anyone have any other questions? Again, feel free. I will just be walking around for the next two days, so feel free to grab me. And I might want to have a conversation with you, as you know, Brian. <laughs> it's very cool. No? We're all good? Yes. Uh, maybe one short question. Uh, I didn't get the, uh, the actual how to get there part. Uh, so, uh, how to get there. Don't do any configuration whatsoever. Right, so I'm a developer. I've got my source code. Um, I've built my application. I've got the configuration file for, say, Open, J, uh, for Open Liberty in there. I just download, I make sure I've got Docker or containers on my machine. I download the CLI for Paquito. It's just called PAC, the PAC CLI. And I just I literally go to the directory where my, say, my Maven project is and just run the build, and it does everything else for you. Okay, and the, output the output would be a Docker image. Well, an image, not a Docker image, but it would be, um, yeah, an open container image, um, which you can use for whatever you want then. So it just makes our lives as developers not have to worry about all the other stuff, not have to worry about configuring our applications, um, not have to worry you know, about 
you know, making sure we pull the right image from here. It knows where to get the latest Open Liberty image. It knows where to get the latest Open J9 image or whatever JVM you're using. So it just makes our lives easier. All we need is the CLI and just go into that directory, run the build, and it does everything for you. So that's basically yeah. it. Uh, the, yeah, again, the configuration. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I take uh, the advantage of uh, using environment variables, uh, yep. Yes, yeah, so as part of the build, you just spe specify on the command line dash E, and you put your environment variables in there, and they'll be injected into your build itself, yeah. Yes, yeah, if you need to, then yeah, you, just, you can just do it just by the CLI. That's how I generally do it. Um, there are more complex situations, but the, the reality is build packs is trying to make everything simple. So we're trying to avoid those complex situations and letting the build packs and Paquito do all that work for us, essentially. So. Is that all good? Yeah. All right, thank you again, everybody.